Let's discuss the Toolman model. This is a tool for deconstructing arguments so you can better understand what's going on when someone is trying to make and create an argument. What you can expect here is first we're going to discuss the background of the Toolman model and some of its origins and author. After that, we're going to discuss the components of the Toolman model and then we're going to deconstruct three different arguments using the Toolman model. All right, here we go. So looking at the background, so who is Stephen Toolman? It's that guy right there. Uh, Stephen Toolman, he was born in London. He has a PhD in philosophy that he got back in 1950. His most famous book was published in 1958 titled The Uses of Argument. That's one of these books that made a significant impact in the way that people consider and think about argument. He taught at many different schools across his career, including Stanford, Cambridge, USC, but quite a few other schools in addition to this. Unfortunately, he passed away back in 2009, and he was well known for the Toolman model, as well as just overall contributions to argumentation and uh, different content like that, as well as his teaching. But the Toolman model is really the one thing that you could probably say that he's known for the most. So the Toolman model has six different components, claim, data, warrant, backing, rebuttal, and qualifier. Okay, so these are the six different components of the Toolman model. The question of how is this different? So if we look at argumentation, right, this is something he, he just passed away back in 2009. This is something that was published kind of in the 1950s and gained popularity in the late 50s and the 60s. And then we still talk about this today. So how is this different? Well, it's practical. So Toulmin argued that syllogistic logic lacked practical value. So if you don't know what syllogistic logic is, I'll give you an example here. This is syllogistic logic. So a deductive syllogism, you might have heard this before, the major premise, all men are mortal. Minor premise, Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal, is our conclusion. That's an example of a deductive syllogism. So what Toulmin was saying is like, look, this is, it makes sense, it makes logical sense, yes, that's true, but people don't really talk like this, and people don't really formulate arguments like this when they are out in the real world. So the idea was that how can we create something that is more useful, that's something that's more practical in the way that people actually experience, use, and understand arguments. Toulmin also argued that this type of reasoning, while clear, again, that, like the syllogistic logic, while it was clear, it lacked practical value. So he developed a way to understand arguments that first found a claim and then found justification for the claim. So as opposed to using premises and things like that, first we said, what, he says, what's the claim? And then we're going to find justification around the claim, which is typically how arguments are structured and put together. He argued that an argument, in order for it to be successful, the claim needs to be justified in the minds of the audience. So that's the, the, we need to understand the claim and then understand the justification for that particular claim. So he created the Toolman model, which is pretty awesome just to name it after uh, yourself, <laughs> right? That's super cool. Uh, so it's got six different components, like we said a minute ago. Uh, we've got three, though, that are essential and then three that are non-essential. The three that are essential, meaning that these show up in every argumentation situation and every argument, are the claim, the data, and the warrant. Now, sometimes you'll use, uh, you'll hear, uh, instead of the word data, you'll hear the word grounds. Um, we, you'll hear those used interchangeably. Uh, I don't like to use the word grounds because a lot of times if you're talking about debate, sometimes you can hear people use the word ground in terms of uh, like how many arguments are on one side of the issue versus the other side of the issue. And if there's not really any ground on one side, then it's not really a fair argument or a, a good debate to be able to have. Um, so we're, we're going to use the word data, which is why we choose, uh, or why I'm choosing to use the word data instead of grounds here. But know that sometimes people do use the word grounds instead of data. Those are our essentials. And then our non-essentials are backing, rebuttal, and qualifier. So these three different terms, these three different ideas, they might not show up in every argument, in every argument situation, but uh, they are all part of the Toolman model. So we just might not see them in every situation. We'll show you what these mean uh, after we define them, and, after, and then we'll give you some examples. Okay, so looking at these, the essentials, the claim, this is really the conclusion. So if you look at the video that we had um, in class earlier where we're looking at claims of fact, claims of value, and claims of policy, and I'll put a link to that in the uh, description below here as well. The conclusion is really the thing that we end up with. So this is the claim, it can be claim of fact, claim of value, claim of policy. The data is the evidence and the reasoning. So this is really the support for that claim. And then the warrant, this is the reason that the data is appropriate to support the claim. 
Okay, so let's say that you have a conclusion. Let's say that you have a conclusion that uh, um, Eric Robertson is president of the United States. We have data to support that. Um, you know, whatever it is, let's say that um, I'm a college professor. And then the warrant would be the reason the data is appropriate. So that data would actually not be appropriate to support that claim, right? So uh, there's data that would be supporting and data that wouldn't be supporting a claim. And the warrant is our explanation that helps us understand when it's appropriate or, or why it's appropriate to support that claim. We'll get into this more with some of the examples, though. It'll be more clear. With our uh, non-essential components, we've got backing. So this adds strength to the data. So if we want to add additional data to make our data even stronger, uh, maybe something about the source, maybe additional data from multiple viewpoints, things like that, but anything that adds strength to the data. The rebuttal, this responds to objections before they're made. So sometimes you may have an argument and you know people are going to have some sort of uh, concern. The rebuttal is going to be bringing this up in the argument itself in order to uh, ward off any of those potential attacks. And the qualifier indicates the strength of the claim. Okay, so usually this is just a, a couple of words that's in the claim itself, but this indicates how strongly committed the advocate is to the claim itself. And again, you'll see this in one of the examples here. Okay, so let's get into some of these examples. So first we have example number one. This is a claim of fact. Converting to solar energy can save homeowners money. Okay, so we're going to look at the claim, the data, and the warrant here. Okay, so this is a claim of fact. So this is our claim. This is our conclusion, right? Because we're saying that this is, you know, this is true, so we have to defend it. So what's our data? According to the San Diego Tribune, San Diego residents who switched to solar saved on average 5%. Okay, so this is data supporting that particular uh, statement. Now, the warrant, so this is that San Diego is an appropriate sample for solar power usage. So think about this for a second. Okay, so let's say we've got the, okay, converting to solar energy can save homeowners money. And then we've got, according to the San Diegans who switched, they saved an average of 5%. So the question is, does this make sense for you? Well, if you live in San Diego, the warrant, you're probably cool with this, right? Because you're like, yeah, that makes sense for me. But if you live in Minnesota, you're probably going to be getting less sun than people in San Diego. So that data is probably not appropriate to support that particular claim. Okay, so notice how this data is, it does support it for some people, but it also doesn't support it for others. And the warrant is what's going to help us uh, understand what data is appropriate and what data is not. Example number two, this is a claim of value. It's definitely better to break up with someone in person than over text. Okay, so this is a claim of value. The data here is, well, my friend broke up with his girlfriend over text and she was really upset. Okay, so we've got a single person giving lay testimony here uh, about something that happened, which is, you know, a lot of times this is the way that arguments show up. So the warrant, again, this is, is it good enough? Like, you know, is that data good enough for you to, um, to, to support that claim? So the experience my friend went through can teach us a valuable lesson. Okay, so you were saying that this data right here, if we were just, to, you know, let's say you never thought about this before, right, and you had someone saying it's definitely better to break up with someone in person than over text. You're like, okay, well, let me think about that. And then they say, yeah, my, bro my friend broke up with his girlfriend over text and she was really upset. So because of that, you know, it's a really good idea to break up with people in person instead of over text. Okay, so is this enough data for you to support that claim? Okay, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it could be, depends on the people. Um, Depends on what you think about this. Let's look at this and we'll add some backing to it. 10 of my other friends also say that it's better to break up in person than over text. Okay, so now we have backing, right? Because this was the data here. My friend broke up with his girlfriend over text. She was really upset. Okay, well that's some data. Maybe it's not enough. Well, here's some backing. 10 of my other friends also say this. What if we have a rebuttal? Some people say it's easier and less uncomfortable, but even if it's uncomfortable, it's still the right thing to do. Right, so what would be the reason that some people might break up with someone else over text? Maybe it's because it's just so uncomfortable to uh, have to do that in person. Uh, well, yeah, that might be true, but it's still not right. So it would be the right thing to do in order to do it face-to-face. -face. Okay, so these are the objections that someone might bring in. And then also we have a qualifier. So this doesn't, so notice this is a little bit different the way we're using this little speech bubble here. The word definitely is the qualifier from the claim. So let's go back over here. So uh, because it expresses the degree of certainty in the argument. So let's go back over here to our claim. It's definitely better to break up with someone in person than over text. That word definitely, right, it implies a degree of certainty. We're not saying it's probably better. We're not saying it's a little better. 
We're not saying anything like that. We're saying it's definitely better. So we are indicating the degree of certainty here, and that would be considered a qualifier. Okay, let's do another example. Example number three. This is a claim of policy. The United States federal government should legalize marijuana for recreational use. Let's look at our data here. So that was our claim, right? It's a claim of policy because it's advocating for a change to the status quo. Our data here is that multiple states have legalized marijuana and increased tax revenues. Okay, so let's say you're using that data to support that claim. So is this enough for you to support that claim? If it is, then you would probably agree that an increase in tax revenue is a good reason to legalize marijuana for recreational use. Right? But if you think, well, that's not really enough, right? that data is not exactly appropriate, or I need more data to support that claim, uh, then you, that would work into your warrant. Right? So your warrant, again, is your understanding of the data and how it's appropriate to support the claim. Okay, so if you believe this, then an increase in tax revenue, revenue is enough for you uh, to want to legalize marijuana. Okay, so what we covered today, we discussed the background of the Toulmin model and Stephen Toulmin himself. We also discussed the components of the Toulmin model, those six different components. We discussed the three that are essential, the three that are non-essential, and then we just deconstructed three different arguments using the Toulmin model. So again, this is a great tool for deconstructing arguments. If you want to read a little bit more about this in Herrick's 2015 Understanding and Shaping Arguments, from pages uh, 46 to 52, he goes over this as well and gives some examples from the original book that Toulmin wrote. Um, and it's also pretty interesting. Cool. So I hope this was helpful. And now if you ever see an argument, you can just say, okay, what's the conclusion? What's the claim here that's being made? What data is actually being used to support this? And is that data appropriate to support that claim? And from there, you'll have a better understanding of what the argument actually entailed.